All right, hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is April 9th, 2024. I figured I was going to give one extra day to uh, between videos this time because of the eclipse, of course. <clears throat> Excuse me, with all of the the excitement and all the goings on of the eclipse, um, I figured I'd give everybody a day to, to settle down and take a breath and uh, get us back into seeking and searching him out. You know, we weren't one of those people expecting a, the pre-trip to happen or anything like that because of the eclipse. But do we believe, do I believe that it's a sign? Absolutely, it's a sign. We know the sun, moon, and stars are there for signs, seasons, days, years. It's absolutely true. It was a sign. And when we add it to everything else, it's incredible. And so we, we're we not dismissing it, but now that it is passed, we will, we will continue to pursue him. We will continue to ready ourselves. We will continue to diligently seek and search him out. Because I believe, as many, as, you, as many of you do, that we are, in part at least, a group of people being prepared. There is so much evidence. There is so much proof of it in the revelation over these past six and a half years that it is truly undeniable and that's what we're going to talk on a bit today a little bit more of this 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 refresher and building on with new insight to this remnant worker group this is what is happening here this is what is being prepared does it mean as, I, as you've heard me say many times does it mean that Everybody who's a part of this ministry in some shape, way, or form is going to be a remnant worker in the end of days. No. But is a good portion, is there going to be a, a good number of people? Probably. Because we're being prepared. We're being prepared with the understanding of his revelation that when he comes for the 40 days, we'll complete the understanding in us and the time of tribulation will begin. So I want you to remember as, as we get going and once I get into the scripture part of it, you're going to remember certain words that we've shared along the way. Things that have been revealed to us that that we know have been mysteries since the creation of the world. Mysteries that have been hidden and revealed for the time of the end to a group of people who are prepared for diligently seeking. And I've said it before, I don't believe we're the only ones. But we're the only ones in this aspect. There are so many other watchmen out there that are preparing, are getting ready, but yet refuse to see the revelation. I don't know why. I don't have an answer for it. Except to say we have seen evidence that it's not meant for everybody because there is a group within this remnant being prepared with this revelation. We saw it in... Um, was it in Polycarp's apocryphal writings? You know, one group and then Polycarp comes along and, and didn't really have it, but this other group had it. You know, we see this type of thing, and we're going to see that as we discuss this and get into this here today. Because this is all about his holy remnant. Okay, that's what we're going to talk on today. Things we've talked on many times, but I caught some new stuff as I was digging into something that our brother Jake shared with me. I was doing some digging and found an interesting connection as I was going into Revelation chapter 1, a place, as you know, we haven't gone into very often because it always seemed pretty straightforward. And I started reading it because some of the, the beginning of it sounded very post-trib. And then I kept reading and, and saw the way it was laid out as it, as it moved in the second half of chapter 1. And I thought, wait a second, that sounds familiar. And lo and behold, you guessed it. It was familiar, giving us more evidence to the revelation we've already revealed. And this is something, when I say mysteries from the beginning, think of like, as it was in the beginning, so shall it be in the end. The, the mystery of the first and the last, right? The first and the last. The Aleph and the Tav. Aleph. Do you know any other ministry who has had the revelation of Aleph as we've been given? I don't. 
and that's connected to this remnant group. It's awesome. So those are the types of things we're going to go into today. And I'm going to start, of course, as I always do, to anybody that's new coming across this video or anybody that's newer and hasn't yet watched, you can go to ministryrevealed.com right here and click on the intro tab and watch the first four videos. Or you can stay on, on YouTube, come to the playlist link right here and watch the first four videos in this playlist. It is going to blow your mind. The first video that has this image on it is a 22 minute intro into the next three videos. The second video is a 30 minute intro Bible study to the revelation of the differences in the gospels and reveals that they are all prophecy. That these differences that the church has told us over centuries that it's just perspective. We prove to you that it's because Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptic gospels, as the scripture has said, the last will be first and the first will be last. Matthew, Mark, Luke, in the end goes Luke, Mark, and Matthew. And you will realize there's a reason why we have three synoptic gospels. They are speaking to different groups of people prophetically. In the end of days, it relates to the pre-trib, in Christ, spirit-filled bride of Christ, and a remnant worker group from them. The Mark group is the group that is the church, the world, that wasn't prepared or that hasn't yet come to Christ, that will wake up, that will renew themselves to Christ or come to Christ for the first time, that is called the world or the house of Israel that the Gentiles are grafted into. That is the mid-trib great multitude rapture from Revelation 7. And the post-trib is Matthew's gospel. Matthew's gospel is to the house of Judah. So all of these debates, all of these, how can a story be the same story yet have a completely different conversation within it? Perspective never can cover these parts of understanding. So they always brush over it because what they do is they teach us from the gospel of Matthew and barely go to Mark and go even less to Luke. They only go there to point to certain other things that maybe wasn't there for clarity in Luke, in, in Matthew. And so everybody's foundation is built on Matthew's gospel. Well, once you realize this difference is in the gospels, just in that 30 minutes, you can then go to this, the third video, which is another 30 minute video that reveals that the end of days is not seven years long, but is truly unequivocally, in fact, 14 years long, two sets of seven, with a portion called above that is 50 days. It begins with the pre-trib, there are events during the 50 days, and then the 14 years begins at the Feast of Trumpets. We've broken this down, we've got videos explaining all of this, and this is what you're going to begin to see in the third video, the 30-minute intro of the 14 years, and how did all of this get missed? How, how did we only end up seeing seven years for so many centuries? The answer is everybody's understanding has been from the Gospel of Matthew. When the world's foundation of the Gospel comes from Matthew, they're looking, unbeknownst to them, through the eyes of Judah. And so when somebody says the pre-trib happens first and everybody who believes in Jesus, everybody is going first, they're really talking about being at the end of seals in Revelation chapter 7, and then there's going to be seven years of tribulation. Well, unfortunately, because they've never understood what Mark's gospel is about and what Luke's gospel is about, that's as if they're at the end of seals because Mark's portion is the seven years of seals. You will come to see that pre, mid, and post are all true, and that's why the gospels or, or the... The epistles and many things throughout Scripture, people can defend pre, mid, and post from Scripture. When they try to defend pre and mid from Matthew, they're wrong. Because Matthew is clearly post when it says immediately after the tribulation of these days, of those days. And then it goes into the story of Noah, which relates to the final 14th year of tribulation. It's absolutely fantastic. And I promise you it's worth every moment of your time. When you go to the fourth video, that's the big one. It's about two hours and 45 minutes worth every moment 
of time to listen because you're going to see the reason it's all because of Matthew. And when you begin to see it and you begin to understand it, you will never look at Scripture the same confused way you had before with these questions that you must have had in reading the, the, the Gospels and in reading these differences even within the discourses. If you go to the, to, the, to the website, after you watch that Because of Matthew video, you can keep going. And there's a, there's a going deep, like a three-hour video of the differences in the Gospels. The one after that is the revelation of the discourses that go Luke, Mark, and then Matthew. It will blow your mind, and you will see and understand the book of Revelation and prophecy as you have never, ever understood it before. It's so wild that over the past six and a half years, it brought us all the way back to the beginning of creation. These revelations are so powerfully revealing and confirming in Scripture that hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of places we've revealed them in the same storyline prophetically over and over and over again, all the way back to the creations it's that powerful it is that wild and i promise you it will be worth your time all right so you can do that from the playlist here or you can go for, to ministryrevealed.com and go to the link that the tab called um intros the other thing sometimes you'll hear me say uh, as you will tonight <clears throat> that um uh you know somebody shared this in the forum or shared this with me in the forum uh, if you want to join the forum, we've got about 1,200 people around the world, a number of them in there from, from I mean, all over the world, sharing uh, sharing uh, uh, Bible studies and prayer requests, and they're doing Bible studies. People are meeting together and doing Bible studies. People have started channels from the ministry, um, uh, prayer requests, all sorts of things going on. You can come and join watchmen in there that are that are sharing events going on around the world. And so if that's up your alley and you're a watchman and you want to be with like-minded brothers and sisters, you can come join us there. It's absolutely free. It'll only take you a few seconds to sign up. And uh, you can post and share with us your thoughts and things that you're finding as well. All right. So now let me get started. And I want to start with this. I thought this was pretty cool. So our brother, one of our brother Herman, uh, who's from the UK, check this out. He went to, uh, like, I think it was ChatGPT, and he asked ChatGPT this question. Do you know the YouTube channel Ministry Revealed and what they stand for? Now listen to what the ChatGPT said about Ministry Revealed. You know, with all of the negative stuff that we get, I was surprised we didn't get something negative come back with it. Listen to what the AI responded. I thought it was really cool. A number of us were just like, oh, this is great. Ministry Revealed is a YouTube channel with a mission to uncover the revelation of Jesus Christ. Led by the channel owner, it delves into a 14-year understanding and explores the open books. Here's what you need to know. mission and uh, Purpose and mission. Ministry Revealed aims to bring light to the true tribulation timeline. This timeline consists of seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets. They also focus on the understanding of the Gospels in a, new, in a unique way, revealing hidden layers within the synoptic accounts. Their approach allows viewers to see with end-time eyes, providing fresh insights into Scripture. Additionally, they explore the question of who the Gospels are speaking to, unraveling the mysteries from Genesis to Revelation. The key topics covered, Gospel differences, if you've ever wondered why there are apparent differences in the same stories across the Gospels, Ministry Revealed delves into these discrepancies. Prophecy interpretation. They offer interpretations of prophecy shedding light on often debated topics. Literal mysteries. By understanding the Gospels and their audience, viewers gain insight, insights that have caused divisions and questions for centuries. Books of the Bible. Their exploration extends from Genesis 1-1 to the end of Revelation. Well, thank you very much, ChatGPT, because I'll tell you, I, don't, I never use these things. I'm just an old-school 51-year-old in his garage, 
and uh, I just seek his word. And we've got some brothers and sisters out there seeking and searching in all sorts of ways. And uh, I didn't expect this either. So I thought this was pretty cool. You can see it listed our website. Uh, our donations come through PayPal. We wrote a book that is available for purchase on Amazon in book or um, uh, uh, e e uh, um, ebook. But we do also, as it says, offer it in free PDF in five different languages. So I just thought I'd share that. I thought that was uh, I thought it was pretty cool because I was surprised by it. I never expect to, I, I never to rarely expect uh, any good comments coming back on things like that. So so that was nice to see. Now, who is this group at the end of days? You'll remember this quote. We've shared it many times and it just came back into my thoughts as I was putting this one together tonight. This is one from Sir Isaac Newton. When he said in one of his quotes about the times of the end, okay, as the end of days are coming, that's that's where we are. We are a group right here that he's talking about. A body of men will be raised up who will turn their attention to the prophecies in the midst of their, uh, sorry, and insist on their little literal interpretation in the midst of much clamor and opposition. This, it's like he foresaw us. He wrote this with this prophetic insight that he knew would happen at the time of the end. this We're a group of this people right here that he's talking about, that he somehow saw or understood would take place at the time of the end. Okay? Now, I'm going to share this with you. This was, a, this was a great little video. Many of you, if not all of you, know David Wilkerson has uh, since passed. But listen to this powerful video. We're going to listen to the whole thing. God's doing something very hidden. It's very quiet, but it's so awesome and supernatural that it's beyond human comprehension. In fact, what the Lord's doing right now is going to affect the whole world in these last days. And here's what it is. He's preparing a very small but most powerful army of dedicated Christians were more dedicated than anybody who followed Hitler. They were considered to be among the most loyal people on the face of the earth. But folks, this army that God is raising up is going to be the most dedicated army on the face of the earth. Never before anyone is pure, devoted, and fearless as this remnant that's coming forth. They're going to come forth and do exploits and they're going to shake hell, literally. This new army is going to be made up of handmaidens of the Lord. It's going to be made up of servants of the Lord, ordinary Christians who lay hold of God, and God lays hold of them, and a whole new realm of, of service, a whole new realm of the moving of the Holy Spirit is about to break forth. Much of God's plan that I want to share with you can be found in 1 Samuel. He's going to raise up a Samuel company. Hallelujah. The Holy Remnant. Verse 11, chapter 3. And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel, at which both ears of everyone that hears it shall tingle. It's going to be a shocking thing that God does. This new thing is going to amaze and startle. It's the judgment of God on an old religious system and the raising up of a whole new program of the Holy Ghost. That's what you see in 1 Samuel. It's all about the death of an old church religious system and the birthing of a new holy remnant. I want you to keep in mind that what God did in Samuel's day, he keeps doing in every generation. In every generation, when the, when the so-called church, the organized church, backslides and gets cold and compromising, God just gives up on it and raises up another. He's always had a people after his heart. He's always had a praying people in every generation. And that's called the remnant. All through the ages, there's been a remnant. But all this remnant that's coming is going to be beyond anything the world has seen. In the second chapter, beginning at 27th verse, right down the rest of the chapter, this prophet looked at Eli, and he said, Behold, the day is coming. I'm going to cut off your arm. I'll cut off your arm. So I'm going to quit this house at Shiloh. I'm going to remove my presence. I'll make you powerless. I'll judge your wicked pastors. I'm going to pronounce Ichabod on you. And thou shalt see an enemy in my habitation. What God is saying, I'm giving up on Shiloh. I'm giving it up, and I'm going to give it over to the hands of the enemy. Folks, that's exactly what's happening in America and the world today. The organized religious system has been turned over to the enemy. The enemy. There are going to be men standing in the pulpit that are going to give the people what they want. If you've got idolatry in your heart, 
you're going to wind up in a church with a preacher with idolatry in his heart. And that preacher is going to minister to that idol that's in your heart. He's going to tell you it's okay to sin. It's all right to be a sports fanatic and not pray or seek the face of God. You can go to many churches, even Pentecostal churches, and it's death. God's not there. God's gone. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely and burn incense unto Baal and walk after other gods whom you know not? And then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered to do all these abominations. In other words, we're safe. We're no danger. We're not going to lose our salvation. The prophet says, go back now to my place which was in Shiloh. And I set my name at the first. And see what I did to it for the wickedness of my people Israel. While the church of Eli was under judgment and being forsaken by the glory of the Lord, God was busy raising up a remnant. And Samuel represents the holy remnant. And I want to show you how God trained Samuel to come up to take the place of this dead religious system, how God had a plan. And this is what God's going to do. This is what he's doing right now. He's training many of you. I believe when I'm finished, you'll be able to know whether or not you're a part of this remnant that he's raising up to do his work in the last day. The remnant is always birthed in prayer and intercession. Always. Hannah birthed Samuel to bitter tears and much prayer. Listen, please. If you're going to seek God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your strength, and you're going to feel the pain and the grief of God for his church, you're going to suffer consequences. You're going to be misunderstood on all sides. You're going to people accuse you of all kinds of things. Hannah prayed, if you give me a man, child, I'll give him unto the Lord all the days of his life. And the word, the name Samuel means God heard my prayer. That's what Samuel means. Folks, God's hearing the prayer of a people in his house, of people who yearn for an outpouring of the righteousness of Jesus Christ, of people who yearn for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon their sons and their daughters, of people who want to see the glory of the Lord come down on his church, of people who want to see God move in a very special way in these last days. God's going to hear their cry. Now, these are people who are really on their face seeking him. These are people who are pouring their heart out to God. And there were people that were given, according to Hannah, given to the Lord all the days of their life. These people are so committed, there's no thought of backsliding. There's no up and down, in and out, hot and cold. They are wholly given to the heart of God. Do you know that Samuel was such a man of prayer? And all the people said to Samuel, Pray for thy servants unto the Lord thy God, that we die not. Folks, there's going to be a praying remnant that people will go, not for counseling, but for prayer. God wants to raise up prayer warriors who've touched heaven. And the training of the remnant... It's going to be trained to know the voice of the Lord. God called. He spake to Samuel. He wasn't speaking to Eli. God's trying to raise up an army of people who know his voice, who hear from him directly. And what was the first thing God told Samuel? God implanted in Samuel, and he's doing it in the remnant. He planted a vision of God that says God will not put up with sin in his house. I want to show you my hatred for sin in my house. I want to show you my hatred for compromise in the ministry. I want to show you what it's going to take, Samuel, to hear my voice and walk with me. The time is coming. The time is coming when people are going to want to hear this word from heaven. And folks, if you want to hear from God, God will speak to you. That means you don't go into his presence carrying your load of sin with you. You allow God to deal with that sin. You allow God to take that temper away from you and sanctify it. You ask God to do what he has to do in your life. The Bible said men's hearts will fail them for fear, watching those things coming on the earth. Folks, it's going to be beyond anything we could imagine. But there's going to be a holy remnant that are steadfast and sure, unmovable. You're coming here now that God would put divine principles in your soul and fire you up and get you off the fence and get you seeking his face and deal with sin in your heart. Paul, oh, folks, get into this book. Get into this book. Get along with God. Let him begin to speak to you. are nothing, the things that are despised, and I shall raise them up and anoint them. I'll send them forth to do exploits in my name. Volunteer your soul, body, and spirit, and mind. 
and cry out to the Lord, Here I am, send me. I will lay hold upon you, and I will anoint you, and I will open doors for you, and I will stir your heart, and you will know me, and you will know my voice, and I will use you to glorify my name. You will never have a name, but my name will be glorified through your lips and your heart. You'll never be recognized, but I'll recognize you. And on that day, I will reward you because you were faithful to the call. Well, I guess that covers it all. See you for the evening. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Man, if that doesn't get you going. Does, didn't eight minutes and change cover so much of what we talk about here in the ministry? unbelievable the stuff i was trying to make little mental notes as i was listening to it again but i couldn't there was like a dozen of them and i, I just kept forgetting the other ones because they just kept coming and coming you know what volunteers right what do we know volunteer warriors what what's coming for the for them in the end the reward with the lord all of these things over and over and over in this one eight minutes and change you know another place you guys should check out if you haven't is our sister petra's channel it's called His Fair Maidens. So you, you heard that even he mentioned it in uh, the, the Wilkerson video. He even made a mention, right? Because it's going to be maidens and servants, meaning the males and the females. We know who this is talking to. And this was a great one. I was watching this. This again, this was posted in the forum uh, just a couple days ago, maybe two, three days ago. And I thought I had seen it, but I don't know. I, maybe I just wasn't fully paying attention, but I was listening to it this time. And uh, it, it's so powerful. She's got some very, very good words from the Lord. And it's about strengthening and, and getting ready, getting a group ready. That's what we do here in this ministry, of which she's a part of. And she prepares a group as well. And a lot of what she's preparing is with women, but not only women. Okay, we prepare everybody who's ready, but she has a focus with her with uh, his fair maidens as well. And this was another great one. So if you haven't uh, gone to her channel, his fair maidens, uh, check it out as well. This was a great video. So who is this group? You're going to notice this wording will will pop up. As we keep going. But who is this group? All right. We know that this group is right here. So if you recall from when we've taught these things in the past, we have revealed the seven churches in the end of days. Unequivocally, we have understood it. It's there. It's laid out. We've got it. It's been a mystery for centuries as to how it was going to play out in the end of days. I've said it before. I remember hearing Chuck Missler say that he knew that even though he didn't know how, he knew that one day it would be revealed as to how the seven churches will play out in the end of days. And we've revealed it. Talk about a blessing, right? But it couldn't have happened without the revelation of the Gospels, which reveals the years and brings us to the churches and everything else. So what do we know about Laodicea? You know, Wilkerson even said it in this when he said how, you know, they, they think they're all saved, right? No, I can't lose your salvation. Well, what do you mean? Who do you think this is talking to? Of course, there is losing of salvation. For those that are really in Christ and really spirit-filled? No, of course not. You wouldn't even think of it. But what's the difference? You spend time in your word. You're diligently seeking. Do you know how, do you know how important that is? Do you know what a big, massive, enormous deal it is? To spend some time every day in the word of God seeking them out. Remember, I'm going to go a little off script here because even though we know it, I want you guys to be reminded of this because, again, this is that group. The, the Enochs. The Enochs are the pre-trib, but from them is also the remnant that we're talking about. A group translated that they wouldn't see death. They ple he pleased God. You first have to have faith to please him. And then what? Believe that he's a rewarder. Didn't Wilkerson say a rewarder of what? Them that diligently seek him. That diligently seek him. Spending time in his word is how you diligently seek him. It's awesome. All right. So 
when we come into this, and we know that we are right now in the Laodicean age, the whole world of church that even has a little bit of understanding and those who have a lot will tell you that we are indeed in the Laodicean age. If you recall, what have we said in the past about Laodicea that comes first? Remember what Jesus says in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and him with me. We know what this means, don't we? We know precisely what this, who this is speaking to. Now, is there an application in the Laodicean age and, and, and people receiving the call of the Lord in their life and so forth? Absolutely. But we talk about it prophetically, the prophetic layer within Scripture that is being spoken from Genesis to Revelation. And what do we know this is connected to? This is connected, of course, to Luke chapter 12. Remember what happens? <clears throat> These final words of Laodicea are a picture of, of the moment before the tribulation begins. The moment before the, the pre-trib group, the Gentile bride of Christ is taken. Remember this? In Luke 12, 35, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning and you yourselves like, uh, like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord when he comes shall find watching Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. When he comes and knocks on this group's door, they will be ready, this holy remnant, fair maidens, we'll call them the holy remnant, this, this servant group of the Lord will be ready. Do you see what's happening? He's telling them in advance. Be ready and be girded about when I return from the wedding. This is the first watch group. This is the Luke remnant workers. The Gentile bride is about to be taken, but he lets this group know first. Just like we see at the end of the seven churches, the second last verse, he's telling this group exactly that. And then he we'll, we'll get into this later, but the very uh, sorry the third last verse and then the second last verse <clears throat> revelation 321 he tells them what their reward is going to be we'll get into that later so he's telling them at the beginning be ready and he tells them what the reward will be at the end when laodicea in tribulation days are over we see then of course then there's a second watch and a third watch the second watch we know are the 144,000 and the third watch are the tribes during the millennial reign. This first watch group, he is warning them before the pre-trib group is taken and he's going to the wedding. Who is this group? We know it very, again, this is something we know very well. Let's go into our wonderful Esword. When we go to Esword, we know that there's a wedding story a wedding feast in Luke, there's none in Mark, and there's one in Matthew. We know it's because one is the Gentile, one is the Jewish bride at the end. This wedding feast, we talked about many, many, many times when he says, When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him, and you're told to go sit down in the lowest room. He says, just go sit in the lowest room. And if there's a place of honor for something for you, he will come and get you and call you friend, go higher. We've talked on this many times. And this is the piece of this meal that he's having when he returns from the wedding. This is why, as we've shared, that the great banquet that is only found in Luke's gospel after the parable of the wedding, this is precisely the group that he was speaking to in Luke chapter 12, that he was forewarning, saying to be ready when I return from the wedding. Be girded about that when I knock, you will open unto me, and I will come and sit and have a meal with you and serve you. 
There's the wedding. The pre-trib taken to the wedding. And when he returns from the wedding, he's having his meal with his remnant, holy remnant workers, who are those who are going to be part of the resurrection of the just, as we have covered many, many times. Who else is this group? We know them from Luke chapter 24, right? Luke chapter 24, we see this remnant group represented as the two on the road to Emmaus. This two represents the, the, the John the Baptist types. We know one is a representation of Moses and the other is Elijah. Do you realize, did you realize this in all of our teachings? that that this these two that are called the witnesses okay you only find this wording in luke so here's the two of them on the road to emmaus they're with jesus we find out that they end up having a meal okay in luke 24 30 he says and it came to pass as he sat at meat with them he took bread blessed it break it and gave it to them this is the only group from the end of luke compared to the end of mark compared to the end of matthew this is the only group that he sits down and eats with and has a meal. Remember the ones in Luke 12? Right? When he returns, he's going to have this meal. This is when he returns after the wedding. And he's here on the eighth day. He returns on the eighth day. He has this meal with them. And the 40 days of the Son of Man have begun, which is in that 50 days of the portion called above before the 14 years start. Okay? Well, what does it say? about these two well we see that he's going to open their understanding right he's going to complete this this prophetic revelation that's been happening with the law of moses the prophets and the psalms of these things that are still to be completed concerning him and he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and then what does it say luke 24 47 and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at jerusalem and what does he call them you are witnesses you are witnesses so there's two on the road to emmaus he has that meal with them they're the ones that he opens their understanding and he calls them the witnesses isn't it isn't it interesting that we know the picture of when the lord comes on the eighth day after the wedding which is connected to Luke chapter 9. There's those who will not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. And he's coming in the transfiguration story, a picture of him coming on the eighth day just before the end of the seven years, which is to the Feast of Trumpets. So it's before that because it's part of the above. What do we know about when he comes at this time? Oh, Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah. You see what's happening? There's there's not only a, 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 a two witnesses in the in the sense that everybody thinks of, which we've revealed in the time of trumpets, which relates to Eli, uh, um, uh, uh, Zerubbabel and Joshua, which is the whoever the modern day Zerubbabel will be, and we know Jesus, Yeshua Messiah, who will be high priest and king who will be the Melchizedek on the earth, who will be the Messiah ben Joseph, that is the time of trumpets. They are the two witnesses that we read about in that portion in, in tribulation, in, in the book of Revelation. But during the time of seals, there are also two witnesses. The two witnesses are the Moseses, I'll say, and the Elijahs. They are the John the Baptists, all plural. There might be one who is the main Elijah and one who is the main Moses represented, representation of the two on the road to Emmaus, but they represent two remnant worker groups. What did David Wilkerson say also? He said that they would be small in number. What have we been saying about this two this two group we've been saying for years now that i believe that they are the 24,000 not mentioned in the 144 i believe that they are 12,000 
and 12,000. One is the good side of Dan. The other one is from uh, the tribe of Ephraim. Okay? Those are the two that aren't mentioned. And what do we have? Two on the road to Emmaus. Two witnesses here when he returns on the eighth day. Two that he has the meal with. Is it only because they are going to be the only two as, as, as the holy remnant during the time of tribulation, during seals? No. They might be the leaders, the heads of the two groups. But they are not going to be the only two. And we've shared on this so many times, right? <clears throat> because it's fantastic revelation to understand. John the Baptist is a type of Moses and is a type of Elijah. Moses, who did what he did, never got to cross over into the promised land. And it was Joshua, a picture of Jesus, who would then take them over into the promised land. We know that that's a picture of the end of seals. The Moses worker was there. Moses is the one that let my people go and he takes them into the wilderness. That's mid seals, mid -ish seals. When the mark of the beast comes and they got to flee into the wilderness. That's Mark's discourse. And you got that Moses type that leads them into the wilderness. Those Moses remnant workers that lead them into the wilderness. That will be doing these great exploits for the Lord. In this time of, of the greatest revival in the midst of World War III in the first two and a half years of tribulation. Until the Antichrist comes to his full power. And then we've got it uh, with Moses. What happened with Moses? Moses, as I said, he didn't get to cross in the promised land. So what happens? They're now coming out of out of the wilderness. Moses isn't allowed to go. What happened to John the Baptist? John the Baptist gets beheaded when Christ comes and Christ takes over. Sounds similar. Moses didn't get to go. Mo, uh, John the Baptist uh, uh, gets beheaded like a picture of those being beheaded of the workers. When we read from Luke 20, uh, 21, some of you, right, will, will be killed. We know that connection. We'll talk about it in a bit. And we know that some of them are going to die. And then you've got Elijah. You've got Elijah who's going to be doing his work, which Scripture tells us Moses, uh, um, Elijah, is the type of John. And we read just recently and broke it down in Malachi that Elijah being spoken of in Malachi is clearly the prophetic Elijah to come. They represent both, but these guys are during the time of seals. So John the Baptist is a picture of both because what happened with Elijah? Elijah didn't get beheaded and die. Elijah got, to take, take, got taken up in a whirlwind. Got taken up in a whirlwind in the chariots and up he went. Moses is a representation of those who are putting their necks on the line that won't be able to take them over into the promised land. And who do we know is coming at the end of seals? At the end of the sixth year of seals, we know it's the Lord coming on heavenly Mount Zion. <coughs> we'll seal the 144, and then it will be the time of the great multitude rapture. <coughs> so we're getting the exact. It's, it's, um, it's, uh, we've talked about it many times. The, uh, um, uh, oh my goodness, it's on the tip of my tongue. When, when smaller and smaller and smaller, it ends up the same and the same and the same and the same. It's, uh, oh, you know what? Let me find it. I have to, I ha there it is. It's a fractal. Everything is a fractal. And it plays out over and over and over again on different scales. That's what's going on. It goes from big to small to small to small to small. And the exact same thing is playing over again. This is... These are the representation of the holy remnant as a John the Baptist Moses side and a John the Baptist Elijah side in the time of the end. They are the remnant workers. They are the ones <clears throat> that he's having a meal with and that he calls them his witnesses. There's only two of them here that he's talking to. One of 12,000 and one of 12,000. A small, powerful remnant coming forward. <clears throat> you remember? Let's go into Luke. This is where we're, uh, sorry, in Revelation chapter 2. We're going to have a fair bit of focus in here today in Revelation chapter 2. So we know that what happens 
is the Lord is going to meet with that remnant group first. Just as we saw, after he meets with that remnant, bang, the pre-trib is going to happen, right? The pre-trib will happen after that. We're going to talk about that in a bit. And when that happens, the seven-day wedding takes place. He is given power to the apostles, his new modern-day apostles. And then he returns on the eighth day, which is the two on the road to Emmaus represented in the church of Smyrna. And what do we know about them? Well, of course, we see some of you shall be cast into prison. You some shall be tried. Uh, um, tribulation, 10 days. Be thou faithful unto death. So what do we know about them? I know thy works. Tribulation. And you know what's interesting is we've done this study. When you look in the word tribulation, the different words for it, but the definition, the definition of tribulation is not found in Luke's gospel. Pretty wild, right? But it's found in Mark and in Matthew's. That's because this group is working during the time of seals. And it's saying, I know thy tribulation and poverty. This is something that was shared from a brother Jake that I was digging into as well that he had shared with me. Okay? And I know thy poverty. Some of you be cast into prison, be tried 10 days, be thou faithful unto death. Well, we know that the some of you is directly correlated to Luke's discourse. Luke's discourse is the 40 days. You can say the 50 days that are the above 50 days, the pre-trib happens, right? So if you come down to Luke 21, 34 through 36, this is the pre-trib. The whole world is going to be caught off guard, caught up in the cares of this world. And so that that day come upon you unawares, it's going to come upon the world unawares. They're going to be caught in the snare. But those who are watching and praying, those who are diligent in the Lord, spirit filled. Are to be what? Accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the son of man. This is bang. Pre-trip happens. And now the count is on. He's now gone to the wedding, okay? So he informed his remnant workers. Then he takes the pre-trib, and he's gone to the Gentile wedding for seven days. When he returns from the Gentile wedding, he has his meal with that group of remnant workers. Now, listen to what happens. We know in Luke 21, 10, Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. This is the time when the red horse rider begins. This is the time when World War III breaks out at the end of 50 days at the Feast of Trumpets when Jerusalem will be attacked and destroyed and they will be scattered and flee, some taken captive. The destruction of Jerusalem is the beginning of the 14 years. And it happens after the 50 days. Now, listen to what happens in Luke 21, 12. But before all these... Only Luke's discourse has this, as you guys know. And listen to what it says. All the, but before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to synagogues and to prisons. So we can see there's the delivering up into prisons. We come down to verse 16, and it says, And you shall be, be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinfolk and friends, and some of you they shall cause to be put to death. So going to prison and being put to death. What do we see in, in Revelation chapter 2? This exact same group, as we've shared many times, having the exact same account where they will be put into prison and some of them will be put to death. All of this, all of this beginning stuff, all of these things from the end of Revelation 3 in Laodicea, is a conversation with this group of remnant workers who are the Moseses and Elijahs of the remnant workers, that small remnant group in Christ, spirit-filled. And this is when he's here with them at the time of the 40 days beginning. We know they're not only here during 40, they will be here after they get anointed, of course, as well by the Holy Ghost. And then they will go out from Jerusalem. Then Jerusalem is attacked. And the 14 years begin. 
All of this is connected, as many as you, as many of you guys have heard and you've understood over the years. We know who this remnant is, or or how they are represented in Scripture, in the pre. We know this group. Doesn't it? Doesn't it make sense that if there's been a group of people being prepared in the Word? That, that there was a group at the time of the end that would diligently seek for the literal interpretation of these things not be the ones being prepared? Of course they are. Of course it's a group of them being prepared. And Wilkerson even said that they would be voluntarily doing it, right? They would volunteer it for the love of the Lord. Well, isn't that funny? That's something we've recently revealed as well. We know Deuteronomy 16, the three feasts of the Lord. The pre-trib one has to do with the feast of weeks. Then it's the seven days as years of unleavened bread. Then it's the seven days of year as years as tabernacles. And then the eighth day is the new beginning, which is the millennial reign and the final jubilee in the millennial reign. We've understood this. And what did we just reveal in the last video? We see in Deuteronomy 16.9, when we understand that the, the, the it, it's all about winter wheat for the pre-trib. We know it's this revelation we've shared on over the years for winter wheat that comes first. Winter wheat being the Leah. And we can prove it and have proven it. We know that it relates to two things. It relates to to the Feast of Weeks, which is a pre-trib group going, who are in Christ, spirit-filled, going to the third heaven. But from among them, there is a tribute of a free will offering. And just like he had said, voluntarily offering, and that these voluntary people will be what? Soldiers. They will be the warriors of the Lord. They will be the ones in power. They will be the ones filled with revelation. They will be the ones bringing his people in in the time of the greatest, most powerful revival in all of human history in the midst of the beginning of devastation as the world has never seen before. This is why I was saying what David Wilkerson said in that, which is why I want to share it. We've covered every aspect of what he was saying. It's, it's so clearly understood here in the revelations. And look at this. When we've talked about this in relation to the Feast of Weeks, and we've brought it to the Leah and the Rachel, which we recently broke down as well. What do we know about Leah? Leah is the older who has to go before the younger, the firstborn before the, sec uh, before the younger. And when her wedding feast came, he said, fulfill her week. And what is the word for week? It is the Shabua Feast of Weeks. Huh. Funny how that always seems to work out. <coughs> over and over and over again. The difference is, we need to understand what is the true Feast of Weeks. Right? How do you count the true Feast of Weeks? Well, listen to what it even says here in the book of Jubilees. This is about the Feast of Weeks. For it is the festival of weeks and is a festival of first fruits. For, it is a fe for this festival is of double nature and double kind. We haven't shared on this in quite a while. It's a dual feast. It's, it's a dual festival of within the Feast of Weeks. Why? How is it a dual festival? Because it is the Feast of Weeks where the pre-trib group is being taken. And from among them, a remnant portion remains to voluntarily serve the Lord as his soldiers. It is a two-part celebration or Feast of the Lord and how do we know it's timing? How can we truly, properly understand the timing of the Feast of Weeks? 
Also in number, which is in Numbers 28, 26, also in the day of first fruits, this is that first fruits portion. When you bring a new meat offering unto the Lord after your weeks be out. After your weeks be out. Well, the seven Sabbaths that are counted according to the three feasts of the Lord at the feasts of weeks, it is seven Sabbaths. Then you have the Feast of Weeks with the free will offering. You have the dual event. But what does it say? It's when the sickle is put to the wheat. Corn here means wheat. We've explained it many times. We've shown how it is impossible to count these things from March or April. There is no wheat ready to be harvested at that time. We know that the timing begins in either, depending on the year, it's late May into middish June. This year, it starts the seven weeks in middish June. And when the seven Sabbaths are over, it is the eighth of Av, which is the Feast of Weeks at the end of that eighth day. I mean, at the end of that seventh Sabbath day, it is the pre-trib Feast of Weeks, a double portion within the feast, one of the pre-trib and one of the remnant volunteer soldiers willingly serving the lord who is remaining it cannot be earlier and we've explained it we've broken it down and from that point which by the way for anybody wanting to know that equals august 12th and from the following day from the 13th of august it begins the 50 days above the 14 years that we've been talking about and lo and behold, for anybody that's wondering, from the 13th of August or the 9th of Av, the first attack on Israel, 50 days later is October 2nd, the last day of the year, which is the Pentecost true count that followed the 50 days after the seven Sabbaths. This is the harvest or the festival of new wine and what happens that group of remnant workers after having been with the lord for 40 days gone to a place where he instructs them to wait for the anointing of the holy ghost they will receive the anointing of the holy ghost if it is this year which we believe it is and the signs are telling us clearly then october 2nd would be that day and on the day and hour no one knows jerusalem is attacked after they have left Jerusalem. Do you realize as we shared in Luke chapter 24, the only group, the only group that's told that they would begin from Jerusalem? You don't find that at the end of Mark. You don't find that at the end of Matthew. There's a purpose for it. There's a purpose. There's a reason for it. You see, we've shared on these things many, many times. There is a difference between spring wheat and winter wheat. Leah is winter wheat. Rachel is spring wheat. Winter wheat is sown in the fall, lives through winter, and is harvested in the summer. Spring wheat is sown in the spring and is harvested in the fall. Leah is winter wheat. Rachel represents spring wheat. Leah is the pre-trib and the remnant workers that are going to be harvested we believe this year at the true feast of weeks the rachel portion is in for seven more years or in that seventh year after the six years of seals it will happen in the seventh year and what happens in the seventh year well this wheat is planted in the spring and it's harvested in the fall but it can't be used until the following year passover okay these are the types of things we have broken these things down before we have understood it and i i don't think i have ever heard anybody talk about winter wheat being the first that winter wheat is the thing being prepared for harvest at the pre-trib as leah nobody has understood it you know we shared it again something recently with a recent revelation from John chapter 4, when Jesus says, Say you not, there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look, 
for look on the fields for they are white all ready to harvest he was literally telling us you guys are looking for your for your uh rachel because all jews focus on rachel when you should be aware that four months earlier the leah is ready to harvest first it doesn't mean rachel is harvested four months later okay it means that like any harvest every single year there's these harvests every single year they plow it it doesn't mean every single year a pre-trib and a mid-trib happens he has told us you guys are busy looking for the rachel i'm telling you to lift up your eyes because it is time for leah first it is time for the winter wheat before the spring wheat the old before the new now let me share this with you this is pretty awesome because this is an older video look at this september 14th 2015 our brother ivan shared it with us in the forum and i had to share it because i believe this is the first time i ever heard anybody mention winter wheat let's have a listen My Holy Spirit will be coming upon many now, and they will, for the first time, be fully awakened in their spirits to my love and supernatural protection. I cannot explain the jubilation occurring in the heavens as my angels have been eagerly preparing for the arrival of their earthly family. There will be several harvests, my children, and some of my... There you go, several harvests. <clears throat> It, for the longest time, people hadn't considered several harvests. They think it's a pre-trib or a mid-trib, and then the return of the Lord post-trib. They believe in one or the other, and then, of course, the Lord returning at the end. We know there is a pre, a mid, and a post, and events that happen along the way. There's several harvests. Now listen to what she says next. My warrior saints. Warrior saints. Shall be changed in order that they are able to undertake the tasks that I lay before them. Of harvesting the winter wheat. Of harvesting the winter wheat. That's probably the first time I've ever heard anybody comment saying harvesting the winter wheat. And you know what I see as fascinating about that? Is we know that when we go to 2017, how many people have started to really wake up in 2017 as the revelation 12 sign was approaching many right many many people did and then so many of them turned and went back to sleep we've shown oops that's not what i want we've shown and believe that when you go back to 2017 that began the count we didn't make 2017 feast of trumpets fit it was the count revealed all the way back from the birth of christ his ministry all the way through to the time of the end, including the jubilees, uh, the final jubilee, and the counts that got us there from Luke 4. So, isn't it interesting that a group, so she had that back in 2014, and 2017 comes, and I know it happened for me, and I've had many, many, many people share with me over the years how 2017 was the year when things really changed for them too. That sign in 2017 really ignited the the spirit of the lord in them really got people seeking the lord and trying to understand his word better i'm a, a, an example of that and i've heard from many many others that are great examples of it as well so to see that she's saying a group being more spirit filled 
uh, a group being being warrior type being prepared in the end of days who are preparing what who are preparing for a winter wheat harvest who are preparing for a winter wheat harvest and what do we know comes from this winter wheat harvest we know that from it there's this dual feast taking place this dual event within the feast of weeks the group going to the wedding for that gentile bride wedding and the remnant workers who are his voluntary warrior servants a group preparing the winter harvest this is what we're doing <clears throat> do you realize that what's happening within us and what's been happening over these past six and a half years is this growing closer and this revelation of the Lord and drawing closer and closer and more and more understanding continuously being poured out. And what do we do? We're sharing it with others. Many of you are teaching. Many of you are doing Bible studies. You're doing these things all over the world because we are trying to wake up and are taking and are doing our part, not only us, but are doing our part in trying to reach more of the world to wake up and be ready as his winter wheat. But there's a group within this, right? Also being prepared from that Feast of Weeks winter wheat portion that are his holy remnant who will remain to work. <clears throat> now let me take it a little bit further. of this world to keep you from spending time with me pray in the holy spirit constantly allow yourself to be purged of any repetitive sin and let me shine my face upon you if you keep yourself in guilt and shame you are living in darkness and my light cannot penetrate a heart that won't receive it see that's another thing there it was, <clears throat> David Wilkerson speaking on it. We've spoken on it. It's time to purge. It's time to cleanse ourselves of these repetitive sins to allow the Lord to work through us and to what? Spend time in his word daily. Diligently seek him now more than ever. You know, when this eclipse was coming, many of you guys have seen uh, Jim Staley had a video that went viral, almost 4 million views. It just went crazy, and he was on um, Deep Believer, and he was with, uh, uh, what's her name? Uh, I forget her first name, last name, Baghdashi. And I, I couldn't help, many people had shared it with me, and I couldn't help but get this sense as I was watching it of, like, our time to prepare. Like, it's it, it's our time to, to be cleansed, to, to get all of this garbage out. There's four months approximately left. There's no time to waste. It's a long time that will, that's really short, right? Four months is going to feel like it could be forever at times, but it's also a very short period of time. And we need to be cleansed. We need to remain righteous, diligently seeking, but don't wallow in those sins that they allow you to consume your thoughts and allow you to think that, oh, he will never do this for me. It's time to let it all go. Let it go. He died for it already. Recognize your need for my light. Recognize your need to have every last drop of sin purged from your being. See that you cannot cleanse yourself and that you need me to do the cleansing. I alone can sanctify you. You cannot sanctify yourself. So again, kind of like a, a finishing to what I was just saying. So now, sip of coffee. Now we're going to, I'm going to close this. Now we're going to go back into Revelation chapter 2. But 
before we get there, we're actually going to go to Revelation chapter 1. I want you to catch this new confirming insight, which is why I was leading you in the understanding of these things that, yes, we already know them. When it came to this remnant group, what do we know about this remnant group? We know that the Lord is going to make it known to them first. I don't believe weeks in advance or months in advance. I believe within moments, maybe hours, I have no idea. But it, I believe within a very short period of time, as we read in Luke chapter 12, he is going to let his remnant servants know. However, he's going to appear to them or angels appear, whatever it's going to be. He's going to appear to them to let them know to be ready and to be girded and strengthened when he returns from the wedding. Which means he's pre-telling. This remnant group, this little flock, this few in number, as David said. This, this John the Baptist, who are the Moses Elijah groups, of which I believe have, have been able to give understanding over the years that it would be 12,000 and 12,000. If it's more, it's more. But I believe that's the number that's been revealed, and it relates on those two witnesses and those two that are working during seals. and. With that understanding, and then knowing he takes them to the wedding, like takes the, the pre-trip to the wedding, and then returns from the wedding, has a meal with them, and that's the only group he has that meal with, and serves them. I want you to listen to the way Revelation is laid out in chapter 1, in the second half, compared to what we know of what the Lord is called in his names in Revelation chapter 2. So now listen to this. In Revelation chapter 1, starting in verse 10, it says, actually, we can even go to here. So we see this division, right? Now it'll in uh, verse 9, it's the vision of the Son of Man is going to begin. And we see that I, John, who was a, uh, uh, who am also your brother, and companion in tribulation. I find that interesting. You guys know a, a, a John that I've met and there was a powerful thing that happened, I believe. And what do we see? Now we see the names of the Lord. Okay? Listen to what it starts with. In Revelation 11, uh, 1 verse 11, Jesus says, I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. I want you to remember what I was just telling you about what we know about when the Lord comes. Okay, we'll cover it again in a little bit more detail. But he starts by telling John he is the first and the last. Then says, go tell the seven churches these things. In verse 12, listen to what he says. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. Okay? So we see the first thing he says is that he is the first and the last. Then he talks about being the seven golden candlesticks and being in the midst of them. Verse 14, and his head and his hairs were like wool, white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and unto his feet, uh, and his feet like unto fine brass. Verse 16, and he had in his right hand seven stars, now listen to this, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun, <coughs> excuse me, shineth. Watch this. Go down to 20. Uh, sorry, sorry. No, that's right. And it goes down to 16. So what we just saw was it started with him saying he is the first and the last. Then that he's the one in the midst of the seven candlesticks. That he's his hair is white as snow and flames of fire and eyes, feet like brass. And then we see the sharp two-edged sword. I'll give you guys a moment. Ponder those things for a second. 
He starts by saying he's the first and the last. Then he's in the midst of the candlesticks. Then he's seen as hair white as snow and flames of fire. And then his two-edged sword. Did you catch it? Let me help you. Let's go to Revelation chapter 2. Watch what happens when we go to Revelation chapter 2. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 1, it starts with the church of Ephesus. We know who the church of Ephesus right, is, and we know, as we've revealed in the ministry revealed in the book, we know that Ephesus is a picture of the Lord coming and anointing the apostles right after he had taken the pre-trib. We're going to cover it. This is a picture of the beginning of the 50 days. Then when he returns from the wedding is Smyrna. But remember what we just said about Smyrna? We know that right before this time, so before he anoints the apostles, right before he takes the pre-trib bride, he's going to meet with the Smyrna group to let them know to be ready when he returns from the wedding. Okay? We're going to cover this. You'll see what I'm saying. Listen to how it starts. When it talks about Christ in verse 1, it says, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in the midst of his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Well, in chapter 1, it didn't start with the one who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, did it? It started with the being the first and the last. And then it went to the seven golden candlesticks. Well, let's go see what Smyrna has to say. And unto the angel of the church of Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last. He's talking to Smyrna being the first and the last before he's talking to the apostle portion as he who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Did you see that? Look what happens. We see that he talks about him being the first and the last, and then he's the one walking in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Well, how could that be? Why would he have a connection being first to Smyrna before being a connection to uh, Ephesus. Well, it's exactly what I was sharing with you guys earlier. We know, and we've revealed this from Luke chapter 12 and Luke chapter 14. He visits the remnant workers before he takes the pre-trib bride. And when he says, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning and, and you yourselves like unto men that wait for the Lord when we return from the wedding and that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately and he will come in and sup with them and serve them. Watch this. Remember? Remember how it ended? We've shared it from so many different angles. We've shared it from Revelation. Well, we've shared it from Luke. We've shared it from, from his discourse. We've shared it from the wedding parable. We've shared it from Laodicea because we're at what? We're coming to the end of the Laodicean age. And as the end of the Laodicean age is, is finished, it's going to be right here. Whoops, it's going to be right here. Verse 20. Revelation 3.20. I'm at the door knock. And when I knock, if you'll open it, I'm going to come and sup with you and hit you with me. This is that same group. And when does he do this? When does he do this? Right before he takes the pre-trip. Well. When the church of Laodicea <clears throat> comes to an end, what starts the seven churches of the end of days? Precisely as we've revealed, what was in typology in the Old Testament of the seven churches, which played out over 2,000 years approximately in change. Then we've got the is of the church age, the was, the is, and then we have the is to come. This played out over about 2,500 years. This is playing out over about 2,000 years. 
And when the Laodicean age comes to an end, it's going to come to an end with him first visiting his remnant workers, the volunteer soldiers of the Lord. And then, boom, the pre-trib bride is taken. And what happens? It's the time of his espousals. It's the, it's the seven-day wedding. It begins the seven churches over again in the end of days. And what played out over 2,500 and over 2,000 years in the end of days will play out over 50 days and 14 years. This is why the end of days is going to be a time much worse than at any other time in all of human history, which David Wilkerson also spoke of briefly, which the discourses of Mark and Matthew clearly revealed to us as well. Because as terrible as these thousands of years have been in their portions, the end of days is going to be multiplied and more intense because it will play out over 50 days and 14 years. When Laodicea comes to an end, he meets with the Smyrna group remnant workers first. And what did he tell Smyrna? I am the first and the last. He's warning them first. So what we're seeing in Revelation chapter 1 is another confirmation of the Lord meeting with those who he says to that he is the first and the last. And after he meets with them, what's going to happen? He goes to the wedding. When he goes to the wedding, what's going to happen? Well, let's follow the storyline. Let's go to John chapter 20. Okay? We'll go to John chapter 20, and we're going to see what happened. So we understand now. We've revealed it, I think, from four different ways or five or so different ways. <clears throat> excuse me. How we can see the Lord letting this group know first before the pre-trib happens. So after that has happened, what happens next? We have the picture of Mary Magdalene, for which we've explained. This, the name of Mary Magdalene connects us as a picture of the bride in her being her name representing towers, which brings us to the Song of Solomon with the bed of flowers and her breasts like towers and all of that stuff, right? This is a picture of the bride now being taken. This is the beginning of the 50 days. So he meets with the remnant workers of Smyrna. He is going to be the first and the last he tells them. He takes the bride, which is a picture here of Mary Magdalene. And then what happens? The wedding doesn't happen immediately because it says in John 20, verse 19, in the prophetic with the end time eyes, it says, then the same day at evening, which means after he takes the pre-trip, He's going to still return at the same day at evening. And he is going to anoint by this same, whatever the typology is of breathing on these apostles. They will receive the power of the Holy Ghost and they will be the modern apostles for the end of days. Then what happens? He leaves. And he returns what? After eight days again. Why? Because when he comes back on the eighth day, he's returning from the wedding. You following? So what are we seeing in this picture of Revelation chapter 1? We're seeing another connection, just as the others we have proven. He's meeting with the Smyrna group first, because Smyrna is the one he says he is the first and the last. Then, the pre-trib group is taken, and he comes back the same day at evening. He's going to give the apostles the Holy Ghost, for which to the apostles, he says, he is in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. And then what do we know? Then the Lord is going to return after the wedding. He's going to be here for the 40 days, and then he is gone. Look at what we read next. 
in the seven churches. Okay? So now we understand this. He's going to meet with these first, just as we've revealed. Then he's going to meet with the apostles and anoint them. And then look at what happens when we read about Pergamum. It says in Revelation 2.12, and to the angel of the church in Pergamos, write these things, saith he which has the sharp sword with two edges. Now, what do we know about Pergamum? We know it represents about mid seals, we call it. About two and a half years in. Pergamum is a representation of the time when the Antichrist gets his power to continue 42 months. I know where Satan's seed is. There's martyrs, right? You hold the doctrine of Balaam. We've shown this within the, the, in the book, in the seven churches breakdown, that Pergamum is a picture of when the Antichrist, who of which Constantine was a typology of, is when, in Mark's discourse, when they flee to the wilderness. This is the time when Antichrist gets his power to continue 42 months, this is when they flee into the wilderness from Revelation 13, uh, uh, the mark of the beast coming, to Mark 13 when they flee into the wilderness. This is that time. And what did the Lord say about them? He told the church of Pergamum that the, uh, these things saith he with the sharp sword with two edges. Well, is the Lord coming? With his sh sword at Middish Seals? No. We know he's not returning at Mid Seals with his sharp two edged sword to defeat the Antichrist and his enemies. We know he's not doing that till the end of Seals. Till the end of the sixth year of Seals, I should say. What do we see at the end of the sixth seal? We see everybody panicking, right? This is the end of the sixth year of seals. This is when he's coming on heavenly Mount Zion. Everybody's panicking. Hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne. Hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne. And from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come. What do we know this period of time is? Well, let's go to Daniel chapter 7 and check this out. We see the, the four beasts. One is the lion, the bear, the leopard. We've explained what they are during the first half of seals. And then we see when the beast, the fourth beast being the Antichrist, when he gets that power to continue for 42 months, and we see that he has the ten horns. You see? There, there's no more the, the, the mountains. He's now got the ten horns. So now he is the beast of Revelation 13, stamping the residue with his feet. And he has the ten horns, just like Revelation 13. In Revelation 13, 1 or 2, it says uh, the beast from the sea, which is this beast here. And what does he have? He has uh, uh, seven heads and ten horns. But we see that the crowns are no longer on the heads, but they are on the horns. This is when the ten horns are there. This is when he has power during the second half of seals. When he has his 42 months. Until what? Until Daniel 7 verse 9. Behold, I held till the thrones were cast down. And the Ancient of Days did sit. Whose garment was white as snow. And the hair of his head was like pure. Right? Clean or what's another word for it? To make clean. We've shown that this make clean is the end of seals. Right? For those who were during uh, uh, the time of seals, the, the sleeping church who had to be made clean. So pure and wool, okay? His throne was like fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire. And look at what we see. I beheld then because of the voice of the great words of the horn which spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain. So he's there. Till the beast was killed, and the beast also was the one that had what? Ten horns. And the description is white as snow, 
uh, hair pure and wool. Now watch what happens. We've explained this and broken this down many times over the years. We know this is the end of the sixth year of seals. So if we go back to Revelation chapter 1, what do we read in the order? Well, first of all, we see that it's not the same order as we read in Revelation 2. And we've explained why with the first one. Because we've been able to prove this out through Revelation. We know he's meeting with them, be, the, the remnant workers, the holy remnant, before he meets with the apostles. Then he meets with the apostles. Well, listen to what comes next. Revelation 1.14. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were as the flames of fire, and his feet were like unto fine brass. Now he's actually describing what he looks like. What do we get in Revel in Daniel chapter 7? We're getting a description of the Father coming and the Son being there. And when we go to the end of Revelation chapter 6, we're getting a description of him who sits on the throne and the wrath of the Lamb. So what are we seeing here? We're seeing a picture of his coming. But what does it come before? Revel uh, Revelation 1, 16, when he's described as out of his mouth when a sharp two-edged sword. Look what happens when we go into Revelation 2. We understand Ephesus. We understand Smyrna. When we got to Pergamum, he describes being a sharp two-edged sword before his coming. Look at what he describes for Thyatira. In Thyatira, Revelation 2.18, he says, Thus, uh, these things saith the Son of God, who has his eyes like unto a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. Why on earth isn't this for Pergamum and Pergamum down here for Thyatira? Because, you see, as we've revealed, when he comes with the sharp two-edged sword, he has to do what? He has to come first. He has to show up first before he can use his sword against who? The beast. The beast. This sword that he's going to use is in a reverse order because if he put it down here at Thyatira, we know that Thyatira, the reason for the layout of the seven churches, how you see them in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, you have Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, and Thyatira. That's to the end of six years of seals. Then what do you get? In chapter 3, you get Sardis, which is the seventh year when the Lord is here. Then you have Philadelphia when the 144,000 go out in the first half of trumpets. And then you get Laodicea, which is mid trumpets, uh, mid trumpet judgments, about 10 and a half years into tribulation until the end of the 14 years or the end of 13 years of tribulation. This is, this is laid out with four and then three. Six years of seals, the Lord coming for the seventh, and then the seven years of trumpets time. It's the layout of the end of days. So in, in chapter 2, if he had told Pergamum that he is the one with eyes of flame and, and feet as brass, and told Pergamum that he was, the, that they were, uh, he was sorry, flames of fire and feet as brass, and that the sharp two-edged sword was for Thyatira, then these people would be, uh, Lord, what's going on? Because it's not meant for that church, because this one, the sword is coming against the beast, who is the one who got his power to continue 42 months at about Middish Seals. He's bringing his judgment on him and those who are with him, which are the ten horns. So when we see the order 
in Revelation chapter 1. He's told us the order of the seven churches in chapter 2. He's meeting with his remnant workers of Smyrna first before he takes the pre-trip. Then he's meeting with the apostles that he will anoint and breathe on. Then he's going to be coming when he returns with heavenly Mount Zion at the end of six years of seals. And when he does, he's going to be with his sharp two-edged sword to destroy the enemy. Remember in Luke, in Luke chapter 22, a story I haven't shared in a long time, but it was one of my favorites. It always gives me a smile to read it. Because we have this, this very strange story, and I don't know that anybody has fully understand it, stood it before until you understood the end of days and how it plays out. He tells them, um, uh, you know, to get their garments. Uh, da, da, da. Let's start in verse 36. Luke 22, 36 through 38. Then said he unto them, but now he that hath a purse, let him take it, and likewise his script. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say unto you, that this is that, that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors. For the things concerning me have an end. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. <laughs> and he said unto them, that's enough. He just told a group of people, everybody who doesn't have a sword, sell what you got, sell your clothes, go get a sword. And it's like a group of them are standing there like, hey, you got a sword? No, I don't got one. You got one? No, I don't. No, I got one. I got one. Oh, do you got one? Hey, Bill, you got a sword? No. Hey, Steve, you got it? Yeah, I got one. So, uh, Lord, we've got two swords. All right, that's enough. It's the strangest story until you realize the end of days, the Lord has two battles. We've revealed it from, again, a number of places of which one is proven out to us in Zechariah chapter two, uh, chapter 14, verse 2. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Now listen to this. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when. Past tense. As when he fought in the day of battle. Okay? Not this battle. This is the one that he's going to do at the end of tribulation. At the, in that 14th year, this is that battle. But he's telling us in verse 3 that there was a battle that came first. This battle that came first is the one at the end of six years of seals. This is the one of the Ezekiel 39 war. The Ezekiel 39 war is not the beginning of tribulation. It is even when people see, I mean, the pre-trib will be gone, and then bang, uh, northern Israel is going to be attacked. There'll be a short Middle East war, and people will probably still think it's the Ezekiel 39 war. It is not. The Ezekiel 39 war will not happen till the end of the six years of seals, and it's the one that he fought. It's the one that we see in Daniel 7. When the, when the beast is first killed. It, it's what is being explained to us in Revelation chapter 1. In relation to the, the Revelation chapter 2. And how the process of these things. Of the seven churches. In the first half of tribulation which is seals will take place. So. How do we know this and how have we been able to prove it? Well, when we went to knowing that there were two swords, knowing that there's one coming in the 14th year when he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives, yet there was one before when he fought against those nations, we've proven in the chapters to years that it's Ezekiel 39. But what else have we done? We saw in Daniel chapter 7. So we see it also in Daniel chapter 7 when he's being described in similarities with pure wool and so forth. And we know it from Revelation chapter 17 to Daniel 7 because it was the ten kings. And look at what we see. We see it right here. Revelation 17 verse 12. And the ten kings which thou sawest, 
uh, the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, and they have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and king of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. This is that first sword with the double-edged sword being spoken about. We've shared how the second war that is being spoken about in Zechariah chapter 14, which happens at the end in, in the 14th year of tribulation, is the Revelation chapter 19 one, when the beast will be, the beast and the false prophet will be cast into the lake of fire first, and then he fights against those nations, right, again in that war. That's what we're being shown. So when we go back into Revelation again, chapter 1, and we follow this storyline, meeting with them, meeting with the, the Smyrna workers, then meeting with the apostles, then coming on heavenly Mount Zion at the end of the sixth year of seals, then the sharp two-edged sword, he's revealing to us the order of things from Revelation chapter 2. Do you notice that the four churches are the exact same four definitions of himself in that second half of Revelation chapter 1? So he's telling us in order, I'm going to be first to meet with those being the first and the last. And this is what I was saying in the beginning. Why is this so interesting to us? Not only does it give more proof and more, more evidence to all these things that have been revealed here over the years, but... What about the revelation we've revealed about the first and the last? Taurus, right? The Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. The 22 years of the end of days. Right? We know the end of days is the 22 years. The seven easy years of Leah. The next seven years of Rachel. The six years for the cattle. Then he renews his covenant or makes his covenant with his father-in-law. And when that 21st year, 14th year is over, bam, it's the 22nd year. It's the, it's the final jubilee. It's the same thing we have here. It started from what? The Revelation 12 sign. The seven easy years like Leah. The seven more years that he has fulfilled for Rachel. Then he's got six years. And it's the six years for the cattle. And then he makes what? A covenant with his father-in-law at the end of the 20. This is when the Lord renews his covenant. And when that final year is over, it's the final jubilee. What do you got? Seven, 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 one. Seven easy, seven years of seals, seven years of trumpets, the new beginning, the jubilee, which is then the millennial reign. All of it there in order. That the first and the last. What is this? Remember we just, not too long ago, I did a video called the 22,000 years. Because everything is a fractal. It's a fractal from the Gospels. It's a fractal from the people. All replaying in typologies, in events from the was, the is, and the is to come. The end of day's revelation of 22 years is no different then the big picture of the 22,000 years from the beginning of creation to the end of the millennial reign, which is the end of 21,000 years, and then you will have the new beginning, which is your 22nd thousandth year, which will be eternity. It's a fractal. How many people have been revealed these things? Connected to what? The first and the last, the beginning and the end. Even the AI said, from Genesis 1-1 to the end of Revelation. We've talked about it many times. And where does the count begin? Exactly as we've spoken about, as the Holy Ghost has confirmed to us, that one thing that the Holy Ghost has given in a, in a confirmation. As it was in the beginning, so shall it be in the end. Taurus is the beginning of the count. So this is what we're seeing. He's meeting with this group first. Then he's meeting with the apostles. And then what happens? Then he's going to be bringing the sword against the beast at the end 
when he comes as the one with fiery eyes and feet of brass, which is at the end of what? The sixth year of seals, which is precisely the time spoken of at the end of Thyatira when it says in verse 22, uh, 227, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Why does it say at this point he's going to rule them with a rod of iron? Because as you know, from Revelation chapter 12, <coughs> uh, the Revelation 12 sign, there's, this is, what happened in 2017 wasn't the sign of what's coming. It was the sign of its coming, but there is going to be seen something when the true Revelation 12 sign happens. The pre-trib is taking place at this time before the travailing, as we've taught in the past, the 40 days of the Son of Man, the two and a half years in the word pained, which is World War III. You have the beast getting his power from the dragon, and then you come to the end of the sixth year of seals, and Revelation 12, 5 is the end of the six year seals when it says, and she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up. For those that don't know, that is the mid-trib great multitude rapture that we have shown many times in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the revelation of the 14 years and above is the pre-trib of those in Christ, like a rapture who go to the third heaven. The second group are those not quite in Christ like the first, but they're believers. They are part of the was caught up, like Revelation 12, 5, that go to paradise. So a taking, a taking. Third heaven and paradise are both part of the kingdom of God. And then, of course, you know, then he's coming to them the third time. So a taking, a taking, and a return, as we've revealed within the Gospels many times. So what we're seeing is this exact same scenario played out when he comes to rule with the rod of iron and the was caught up of the mid-trib great multitude rapture. And here we are in second uh, uh, Revelation chapter 2. In Thyatira, with the end of Thyatira being a picture of the end of the six years of seals when he's coming to rule them with a rod of iron, when he's coming in that description that we see and following it in order from Revelation chapter 1, we see that he's coming like this and then will bring the sword against this beast who Satan gave power to who was killing the martyrs during the time of the worshiping of the beast. He's telling this group, this is the sword coming for them, but that it doesn't come for them until he comes as this. Precisely as we see in Daniel chapter 7. Precisely as we see from, from uh, Revelation chapter 17, with the ten horns connected, and when he will defeat them. It's wild. I just thought that was such a, a great connection because I had never, I mean, I've read through this many, many times over the years, but I'd never, ever seen this. And then just yesterday, I was reading through it, and I thought, well, wait a second, the first and the last, this first and the last connection is, is something important for us because we understand it from Smyrna. Smyrna is the focus of this ministry, this remnant group being prepared. And that's what he called to that group. And lo and behold, look at how he calls them. Look at how it's laid out. I'm the Alpha Omega, the first and the last, and what thou shalt see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches. And then he describes the seven churches. It's the same thing that I was saying earlier. It's like being at the end of Laodicea. And he's going to talk with the Smyrna group first. And then it's going to start the seven churches over again. So he's talking with them first. And then it's the conversation to the seven churches. For which the second one, he's already forewarned. It's awesome. 
Isn't it amazing that those three, I mean those four, in the order that they're laid out, are the the words of his description in the first four, which represents seals to his return and the great multitude rapture in the seventh year of seals? I thought that was pretty cool. I thought the way it was laid out and the understanding of it was was awesome. So as we start to wind this down, man, you guys must be wondering, what is going on? He's an hour and 50 minutes in, and he's getting close to over? What's been going on? These are getting shorter. That's okay. They're action-packed, and they're filled. So let's see how much longer shorter is. <laughs> Maybe it's half an hour. I don't know, right? Now let's go back. Just as I said earlier, today's focus, this was about this Smyrna, this, this holy remnant. That's the that's the focus of today. Well, let's go back into Smyrna and see what else we can find in Smyrna. This is stuff that Jacob shared with me. Listen to this. So in Revelation 2 verse 9, I know thy works and thy trib and tribulation and poverty. Well, remember John in chapter 1 said that he is your 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 fellow worker in tribulation i find that very interesting because we all know you know the the one who jesus loved um there's there's the story you know would he die or maybe he wouldn't die maybe he would be here till the end you know is he going to be here the last two thousand years some people believe so some people aren't sure what that's really saying well i believe if he was i may have met him right we've talked about that in the past but we even see it in revelation chapter 10 when after he's seen all these things and the mystery is over, John had to eat the little book, eat the little book, and then in Revelation 10, 11, it says, And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many people and nations and tongues and kings. So this really seems like a connection to the one who Jesus loved that Peter had overheard and that he wouldn't die. You know, Jesus could have said, hey, look, I didn't say that he wouldn't die. You see, but it could still be that he wouldn't die right away. So it's very, very interesting. And then, of course, we see that from chapter one, your your partner in tribulation. So whoever this John is. Uh, we if if he really is this understanding and he's still here then we'll, we'll probably find out who he is uh, once the end of days begin. So listen to what it says. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty. Okay, look at this word for poverty. This word for poverty is used three times. Now let's see where this word is used three times. Revelation 2.9 and then in two places in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. So, do you think there's a connection? <laughs> it, it's, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? It's only from one church, and it has two connections in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. So, we go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and I don't know why my colors are gone. And we go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and let's see what kind of conversation we have. Now, this is, like I said, I'm, I'm, we're kind of, I'm winding it down here. And I'm not going to go into all of it. But what you're going to notice is if you go in and study these things yourself and you read into this, you're going to see a conversation that we've recently been having as well, just in the last, uh, I don't know, couple, three months. When I shared how it was revealed that as the time of the end approaches and once it begins, there is going to be a selling of, of, of this remnant worker group, a selling off of what we have, a, a gathering together of funds to support each other in this work for the end of days. And it's exactly the storyline that you're reading in 2 Corinthians 8 going into 9. It even talks about, about it being uh, an equality if you go into chapter 9. About this, this zeal in the Lord that, yeah, they're not rich, but this raised money, this money brought forth that they are happily giving 
for the 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 forwardness for this this zeal to to get the word and to reach more people that's what you find out is taking place that this that that Paul is having in this conversation to them but who is he speaking to and that's kind of my focus in this because we know in this conversation that we had just recently in the past that there is going to be a period of time at the end for those once they're understanding that they're servants they are going to generously group and give together so that every worker group in their portion is supplied for to go out and do what needs to be done so i find it very interesting that as our brother jake shared this <clears throat> some of these points in here that it's connected to smyrna it's it's not it's not maybe connected to smyrna it's directly directly connected to the smyrna remnant workers and what do we see listen to this right here in second corinthians chapter 8 verse 2 oh actually in verse 1 it's talking about the churches of macedonia which is greece which relates to what gentiles gentiles right in verse 2 how that in a great trial of affliction that's what, that's something else we just talked about in second in uh, um in smyrna this group who is going through affliction because they're the workers during the time of seals so how that in a great trial of affliction the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberty you see it's this joy it doesn't matter rich poor it makes no difference with this group they just need their 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 uh, provision to go out and do these things in the time of the end now do we know that in the time of the end incredible feats of power and 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 things given by the lord to be able to translate yes these things are going to happen but <laughs> it's not going to be where we're just going to be able to walk down the street and translate anywhere we want to go at any time uh, as workers in the end of days where there'll be moments of these things yes of course but you're not going to have this power to just translate whenever you want and you know not be able to go and go here and go there and just go N no there's going to be needs for supply in these right but the lord will supply and we're seeing this and we've spoken about it so we see this group in affliction but they're in joy in it which is the smyrna group and we'll touch on that that joy that we've spoken about before we'll touch on it as i bring this to an end and what does it say in deep poverty there's that word for poverty right it's used three times in their deep poverty where was the other one verse 9 for in uh, in in second corinthians 8 verse 9 the the other place it's used for you know the grace of our lord jesus christ that through his rich though uh, sorry that though he was rich yet for our sakes he became poor that you through his poverty might be rich sound familiar that though in poverty in this time of the end of days provision will be made to supply needs but in our poverty what does it say for the smyrna group the remnant workers i know thy works and tribulation and poverty but thou art rich but thou art rich let me change that color it's the exact same conversation it's this richness we have in the knowledge in the understanding in the love in the revelation in in being in christ and being spirit filled in this extreme power and authority and blessing and anointing that this holy remnant will have in the end of days so let's see what else it says let's go back to second corinthians 8 and follow some other words like the word deep check this word out for deep profundity and mystery who are the ones being revealed 
mystery of the end of days. It's directly connected to the Luke group, remember? In Luke chapter 24, we know this group being prepared in the time of the end, but he tells them that what? That all things in Luke 24, 44, that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. This is what has been happening here for six and a half years, but only the beginning. Because it is when the Lord comes at that meal that he has with this group, that remnant, the two on the road to Emmaus, the two witnesses, the one represented as the Moses and Elijah's and the, the, the remnant, holy remnant working that are a part of those groups, that he will open their understanding of the scriptures. It's this revelation of the mystery of these things hidden from the beginning. And so this word is used nine times. Let's go have a look into some of its uses and see what else we find. We see deafness in once in Matthew and once in Mark. But are they applicable? No, because listen to how it's used. Some fell on stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no depthness, depthness of earth. Now, can you say in part it does actually apply to this in Matthew and Mark? Yes, you can. Because what is it about? The depth. The depth of what? There are those who fell away. It's, it's the conversation of those falling away in Matthew and falling away in Mark because they didn't have enough what? Depth. They didn't have enough depth. What is the word for depth? Mystery. They didn't, they didn't have enough of the, of the depth of understanding of the Lord, and they fell away. So in, in a sense, you are having this, those who are falling away, but this depthness of earth is because those who do have the depth are the ones being received, are the ones being used, are the ones being revealed the mysteries. So now look what happens when we come to Luke chapter 5, verse 4. Check this one out. It's incredible how it connects. Whereas in Matthew and Mark, it was the story about those who didn't have what they should have had, which was depth of earth. But in Luke's, it's not about a group not having the depth of earth. It's about a remnant group of workers as the apostles were, as the disciples were, when they are told what their work is going to be. And what do we see in Luke chapter 5, verse 4? Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep. Why wouldn't you have this story in Matthew, right? Or in Mark, why isn't this story in the other fishing stories? Well, let's show you. And let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answering and said unto him, Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their nets break. Now listen to this. And they beckoned unto their partners. They beckoned unto their partners, their partakers, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both ships so that they began to sink. What did Jesus say he would do? I will teach you to be fishers of men. And in Luke's gospel is where you get the deafness of a group who are in the deep, who are going to be what? Fishing the great multitude when does the great multitude come in they come in in the middish point of revelation chapter 7 in the midst of the seventh year of seals when it says in revelation 7 9 after this i beheld and lo a great multitude which no man could number this is the great multitude mid-trib rapture this and who's the one bringing them in who is the one who who are the people who 
brought in this great multitude? Well, we know it's two portions, right? We know that it's two portions. There were two ships. So there's, there's only two options here. We know that the Luke group remnant, uh, um, holy remnant workers, they are the ones working during seals. They are the ones who are, who are bringing in and, and bringing the salvation to a great multitude during the time of seals. We know from this great multitude that many of them will die during seals, but the majority, according to Scripture, will make it through to the time of the great multitude rapture. So out of, say, about 1.2 billion people in number, no man can number, I don't know the exact number, but I believe it'll be about 1.2 billion and change. From that, maybe a few hundred, a few hundred million are killed. Maybe it's two, three, four hundred million. But the majority will have made it through alive. That is the catching of the great multitude of fish. But listen, listen to what it said. And they beckoned unto their partners because there were two ships. Now, there's only two explanations for this. It's either one that it relates to the two on the road to Emmaus, which we have explained and broken down for you guys many times and have spoken about it tonight, that it's either the Moses, the Moseses, and the Elijahs. That's one of the options. It's either the, the two witnesses as the Moseses and the Elijahs, or it's the 144,000. Aha. And do you know why I say it's one of those two? Because I believe that the partners bringing in the great multitude, there, there's two ships, that it, it seems more likely, and I, I don't even want to use the word more likely. It seems more, it, it seems more apparent that it's the Moses and the Elijahs. But because this is a prophetic picture that this group is going to bring in the great multitude, which he tells them is what they're going to do with people. So we know it's a picture of the rapture of the great multitude. Well, we know at the end of the sixth year of seals, when these guys have helped bring them in and they went into the wilderness and now uh, uh, Messiah ben Joseph, the 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 Joshua, Yeshua high priest is coming and he's going to be the one to take them over. Here's the thing. What do we know about the 144,000? We've explained it many times, right? The 144,000 are sealed before the great multitude rapture because I believe they are our partners, our partakers with us. This first group, this first boat, and those in it, I believe more likely, even though it seems like it's the Moses and the Elijahs, and it's one group, and then they're coming to help. I don't think it actually fits that. Because the great multitude rapture, which is at the end of six years of seals in the seventh year, it's, I believe, the Moses and Elijah's representing the boat that Simon is in is, is that group of workers, which are the Smyrna remnant. They've already done their work. But remember what scriptures tell us? That they need to call for help because just like David said, uh, uh, David Wilkerson, he said the same thing in saying that it is a small remnant. We know that they're going to need help. To bring in such a great multitude. So I believe what we're really seeing here in this partnership is a picture of the Smyrna, Elijah, Moses, John the Baptist group of workers who caught this great multitude and they're calling to their partners in another boat, which are the 144,000 to help bring them in. And you know what's so great about that is we've taught that before. And we could show it if we go into Luke chapter 10. It's exactly where we see the storyline. 
starting in verse 1, after these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them out two by two before his face. This is a picture, I believe, of the 144,000 that are being sent out at the end of seals into every city and place whither he himself would come. Therefore said he unto them, the harvest is truly great, but the laborers are few. Okay, or you could say, yeah, I guess the the the, the workers during seals that are calling for laborers to come in. Okay, therefore said he unto them, the harvest truly is great. It's a picture of the great multitude, but the laborers are few because it was a few in this remnant that were working during seals and they need the help of the 144,000 to bring in this great multitude. And it says, pray ye therefore to the Lord of the harvest that he should send forth laborers into his harvest. We've shared on this before how I believe this is directly related to the 144,000 coming in to help. When we came into Mark 16, so we saw, and we've got many videos where we've taught on this, the end of Luke, the end of Mark, the end of Matthew are the different worker groups. The end of Luke is the worker, that holy remnant, that work that are there with the 40 days of the Son of Man and then remain during seals. Then Mark, the end of Mark is like being at the end of six years of seals and the Lord has come. He unbraids. You see, you've got the two that he now appears to in another form, which represent the seals workers. And then he unbraids on the picture of those representing the 144,000. And what does it say to them? What does he say to them? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He's helping. This is the 144 helping bring in the creature creation, which is the great multitude rapture. And he that believe and ba is baptized shall be saved, and he that believe not shall be damned. These signs shall follow them. What are they going to do? They're going to take. Uh, they're going to cast out devils, and then they're going to be able to take up serpents. If any deadly thing, uh, it shall not hurt them. This is when the 144 will be anointed at mid trumpets. When the Lord is cut off because the pit is open. So it starts off with them helping bring in the creature creation, which is the world, which is the great multitude rapture. And then they're going to go out and work during the first half of trumpets. And they're going to be able to cast out devils in his name. And it's going to be fantastic. They're all excited. And then what happens? And then. Because Messiah is going to be cut off and the pit is going to be opened at mid trumpets and the beast comes back and Satan had been cast down and the anti false prophet is there. They're now going to be given power so that nothing will hurt them. So what happens if you go to Luke chapter 10? You can see that the the worker group of seals is praying to the Lord of the harvest to help bring in laborers for which the 144 come in and then you see. In verse 17 of Luke 10, and the 70 returned again, saying unto the Lord, the devils are subject unto thy name. What did it say in relation to the end of Mark, which is the end of six years of seals? The 144 are so excited. Remember, they're going to then go out in the first half of trumpets and they're going to be casting out devils in his name. And they were all excited. And then he says in verse 18, and I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven because at mid trumpet, Satan is cast down. And then what does he do? Behold, I give power unto you to tread on, serpent, uh, on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. These are the laborers. I believe they're the ones in the other ship. So as you saw in Luke, it was the seals workers who caught and were bringing in the great multitude. And then they needed their fellow laborers, their partners and partakers. Of the 144, which is why they're sealed first at the end of six years of seals. You go to the beginning of chapter 7. They're sealed first to help bring in the great multitude before they go out then and work the first half of trumpets. Where they're following the Lord wheresoever he goes because he is the high priest and king over them. And they're able to cast out devils in his name. 
Satan is cast down. When Satan is cast down amid trumpets, they're given power over deadly things so nothing will hurt them. You following? So going back to this in Luke chapter 5, this is what we're seeing with the two ships. I believe that first ship bringing in the great multitude are the seals workers for which is perfectly connected to those who are casting out into the deep directly related to the Smyrna remnant workers who are casting out into the deep from that first boat of workers which are the two on the road to Emmaus, the 12,000 and 12,000 who bring in the great multitude and then call to their partners, the 144, the, to help bring in, right? Call unto the, the, the Lord of the harvest so that you have more laborers to help bring them in. And that is exactly what we're seeing. So that first boat, we can see that first ship is connected again to that 144 group. Uh, sorry, sorry, to the Smyrna, group of those in the affliction with great joy and their deep poverty being connected to them listen to what else it says about this group we now know who they are they're the ones in the first boat and listen to these things it's saying about them the other place we find it is in romans eight thirty nine. nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of god which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 11.33 Oh, the depth of the riches both of wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. 1 Corinthians 2.10 But the Lord has revealed them unto us by his Spirit. Hello. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God all related to this group brothers and sisters this group is this same group we've been talking about over the years and have been revealing in greater and greater and greater depth and as I bring it to a close finally <laughs> yes for real we see this from this famous part that we've talked about many times in first Peter 1 Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers. To the strangers. This is the Gentiles. For which we are told in 1 Peter 1, 4, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, which means ready to be revealed in the end of days. Wherein what? You greatly rejoice. Though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through many full temptations, that the trial of your life being more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing 602. Wait a second. Wait a second. At the what? At the revelation. Greek 602. At the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass and he sent and signify it signified this by his angel unto his servant john at what at the revelation of jesus christ to show his servants the things which must soon come to pass who is this group Smyrna! <laughs> Sorry if I scared you. <laughs> Smyrna! It's the two on the road to Emmaus typology. It's the same thing we've been saying the whole time. At his revelation, which is when he comes to reveal it to his servants, his Gentile servants, who have been kept by the power of God to be revealed at the last time 
and it will come when it is the appearing of Christ Jesus to make it known to his servants. Whom having not seen you love. In whom though now you see him not yet believe. You rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. What happens at the appearing of him to this remnant server group? Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Hello. This is that group. This is that group. That's such a powerful piece of scripture. When you understand this, this remnant group, this holy remnant Gentile group for the end of days. They were those of the foreknowledge of God the Father, prepared with an inheritance reserved in heaven for them, that are being kept by the power of God for the time of the end when they will be revealed. When Christ will come to them and appear to them to reveal his revelation. It doesn't get any more clear. We saw this same story in Acts 15. In Acts 15. Again, our chapters to years, it's that beginning. When it says, um, Acts 15, 6, and the apostles and elders came together for to consider this matter. And it talks about the Gentiles. So let's start in verse 7. And then, uh, sorry, and when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth their the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. All right, because they're going to be receiving it at the anointing at the end of 50 days. And put no difference between us and them. Who? The Gentiles. Purifying their hearts by faith. Why tempt you to put the burden of yoke upon the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? It's all about they. It's all about the, the, the Gentiles. Verse 12. Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had made, uh, God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. Remember how he's going to be with them during the 40 days. Then we see in 14, Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles. That's what this has all been about. This feast of weeks. The, the winter wheat, the older before the younger. This winter wheat, which is connected to the true feast of weeks, that has two portions, that Gentile bride and that holy remnant Gentile bride that remains. How God did at the first visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written, after this, I will return and build again the tabernacle. This is when he comes again at the end of seals. And what does it say? That he took out of them a people for his name. What did we just read in 1 Peter? It's a people for God, right? For his elect. Elect according. So the strangers, the Gentiles, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the father through the sanctification of the spirit unto obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of christ jesus grace unto you and peace be multiplied we've understood this guys this is the gentile group being reserved being prepared and i believe we're only a little shy of four months left remember those who are in Christ, Romans 8, walking not after the flesh, but walking after the spirit. Romans 8, 14, a great piece of scripture we've shared many times. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. What our brother Mark likes to call the one oneers, Genesis 1, 1. Right. That's that's that first creation, one, one into one, two. 
It says, for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Just like she was saying, just like he was saying, just like we've taught. We've not received the, bond, the, the, the spirit of fear again, this bondage of fear, this, this bondage of, of, of allowing your sin to, to weigh you down and to just sit in fear. No, overcome it, repent and turn from it. But you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. This has got to be one of the most powerful pieces of scripture that exists. That there, there are people, a group of people, serving the Lord throughout history since Christ, even into the end of days, who are going to be co-heirs or joint heirs with Christ. Christ could you imagine that try to let that sink into your imagination even a little bit I can't I, I personally I can't Jesus was is and is to come he created everything in the will of the father he created it from the beginning and you're going to be a co-heir with him you're going to be a joint heir with Christ Shut up. No way. Some will. Some will. If so be. Did you hear that? If so be that we suffer with him. Do you know why? Remember, we're talking prophetically, not the is. We're talking about the is to come. Were there those in the is? Yes. But we're speaking about the is to come. The Smyrna remnant group. These co-heirs, if so be that we suffer with them. Why are we going to be suffering with them? Because we're going to be doing the Lord's work in the end of days. The holy remnant are going to be doing the Lord's work in the time of the end. They're the ones that have, were, were the ones in the boat who caught the great multitude. They're doing the word, Lord's work and many are putting their necks on the line for it. So that we may be also glorified together. To be exalted with Christ. To be glorified as he was glorified. To be glorified with him. If we suffer with him, you will be joint heirs with him. It's such a crazy, powerful piece of scripture. It, it, it almost seems impossible. It's hard to comprehend. And who is this group represented by in the is to come? We've shared who they are many times. We know they are the Smyrna group. And we are told by this group, listen to this, that in Revelation 2.11, it says, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. We know that in Revelation chapter 20, in, in starting in verse 4, and I saw the thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither received his, uh, neither had received his mark upon his, upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned, and reigned. As kings with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So this group is going to be part of the first resurrection. So let's see what it says. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power. Which means the church of Smyrna, that remnant worker group represented in Smyrna, putting their necks on the line, are the ones who will take part in the first resurrection to reign as kings and will not be hurt as the second death, exactly as it said in 
the church of Smyrna, for which they are then told in verse 6 of Revelation 20, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So they're going to rule and reign with Christ as kings and priests, <coughs> excuse me, for a thousand years. Who is going to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years? during the millennial reign do you think that 500 million people are going to be resurrected to rule and reign with christ as priests and kings over maybe a half a billion people left on the earth at that time of course not it is directed to a specific group of remnant workers of those from the is but we're speaking specifically of those in the is to come who are the spirit-filled sons of God in Christ who will be joint heirs if they suffer with them to be glorified together with them. We see that they will be kings and priests ruling and reigning with him during the millennial reign. Now you remember how we started this with, with the church of Laodicea. And the church of Laodicea, as in the is that we're in, comes to an end he meets with the smyrna group holy remnant first as we showed and when he does we know it's about him knocking and coming to eat and serve them as it all begins at the very beginning when he said be ready and girded about in luke 12 when I returned from the wedding, because it's the group for which he said he is the first and the last, and that came first. When the churches, the seven churches of the end of days, play out in the literal is to come end of days, and the Laodicean church, the 13th to the 14 years of tribulation, come to an end, what did we just see? about those who be resurrected to rule and reign with christ a thousand years if you notice where revelation 20 is it's when satan was defeated and bound if you go to revelation 19 and follow the storyline you see the lord coming to make war again because this is the zechariah chapter 14 verse 12 war this is the second one when he comes with the treading of the grapes and he has a sharp sword right because he's going to fight them again those nations and defeat them in the treading of the wine press of the wrath of almighty god and what does he do he takes the beast and the false prophet and they're cast alive first into the lake of fire and then what happens satan is defeated satan is captured He's bound and thrown into the pit where his thousand years will begin. And then what happens? The thousand years of the millennial reign of the Lord begins. And when it starts, he will resurrect those who will take part with them as kings and priests ruling and reigning with them. So when you go as it started, because we're at the end of the age of Laodicea, and we know that he's going to meet with them and forewarn them that he, when he returns from the wedding, well, when the Laodicean age comes to a complete end and the tribulation is over, what do we know happens? A group is going to be resurrected to rule and reign with him with, as kings and priests. Well, look at how Revelation 3.21 ends. To him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me in my throne. Who sits in a throne? A king. Who is being resurrected as kings and priests? Smyrna. How did the 14 years and above start? With Smyrna. When the 14 years and above are over, how does it end? with the resurrection of the Smyrna, of those who 
uh, um, who suffered as Christ, who suffered as he did for his people to bring in the great multitude who put their necks on the line and will take part in glory in in the uh, what was it glorified together with him and they will get to sit with him in his throne even as i also came uh, overcame and am sat down with my father in his throne bang done finished begins it and ends it and they are both laodicea or sorry they are both the smyrna remnant revealed at the end of the laodicean age right at the very end to the very end of the laodicean age of the is to come this this these revelations when it comes to to the 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 smyrna workers i want you guys to know how important these brothers and sisters are how how incredibly powerful this time is going to be the authority that will be given the the revelation that will be given by christ directly and the power and authority that will be given by the holy ghost this is going to be beyond anything any of us could even fathom. But we will be rock solid. If you're one of them, if we are some of them, this is a powerful, powerful, very important, special group that the Father had preordained from before the foundations of the world. It's crazy to even wrap your mind around it. To think that that us little, I'll say, you know, a lack of a better term, us little peons, if you will. I haven't said that in years. You know, but just us, us fleshly nothings, us, us pieces of dirt. But it's not about our flesh. It's about being in Christ, spirit-filled. It's about the Father's choice, choosing who He will. And He will give us the strength. He will give us the power, the authority, and do so in Christ to take it through right to the end. All of this was about the holy remnant, guys. A very, very powerful group of people chosen by the lord nothing to do with us as i've said before i'm not even saying it is for sure us but the evidence from scripture and the revelation of it as never been revealed before is the evidence of a group being prepared that is why I continue to share it. That is why I continue to prepare. That is why I continue to bring about every part and piece of revelation that I come to understand that will strengthen us and, and draw us in closer and get us digging deeper and deeper and deeper until that time comes. Because brothers and sisters, I do believe with all of my heart that we are here, that we have about four months to go we know the 14 years begins at the feast of trumpets we've revealed how the 50 days come first and the revelation 12 sign will have been exactly seven years ago to this feast of trumpets i didn't make this count up i just followed a count from scripture and how many years do we know there are for the end of days 14 and the 15th being the Jubilee. Right in line. So brothers and sisters, with that, we are in some crazy exciting times. I believe we are going to continue to see more and more activity. More and more things happen. More attacks. And, and let's not forget, we are not dismissing this eclipse sign and, and the comet that was behind and all of these things. 
they are signs for us to be aware of. However, being aware of it, we are already in him. We are diligently seeking and diligently in him. And we will continue to do so until. So let's keep diligently seeking. Let's keep lifting each other up. Let's keep strengthening each other. Let's keep supporting each other. Let's keep praying over each other. And we will see each and every one of you and those who are in your home very, very soon. I love you guys. God bless you. God bless your families always. We'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.